Well, tonight in a first full wealth quiz, we're doing a book review. Now, White Man's Numbers is a tale of Ravi Dama, a finance graduate who finds himself in the world of fund management in London. Now, the company he works for is Pluto Asset Management, and the tale is interwoven with challenges from managing money to making life decisions. Sunil Shah, a former fund manager with Coronation, wrote this fictional book. So does it have any resemblance to the real world? Uh, Sunil, of course, uh, joining us to take us through the book and some of the lessons uh, that have come through from it. Uh, so here's the book. Uh, there we go. That's the uh, book in my hands here. And Sunil, you call it a financial thriller, but uh, talk to us about the book. Give us a brief synopsis of uh, where it starts and where it ends. Hi, yeah, it's a story about Ravi who starts off joining a company in London. He's uh, an Indian guy, um, great at numbers, charming, good looking, but that's where the similarity ends with me. Um, and he basically joins a company that's going to spearhead an office in South Africa. Um, and the idea behind the whole story was um, to provide an insight into the world of money, which unfortunately is very interesting, but incredibly opaque because of all the jargon. So my idea was to use the inside knowledge or you know, having intimately worked and still working with um, uh, fund management is, is, to, is to demystify that world through story. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we read about Ravi's trials and tribulations through kind of being put on the um, on, on test, um, uh, the pressure beginning from day one in trying to prove himself. Um, he learns the tricks of the trade. Um, there are dot-com millionaire stories. There are um, balance sheets with hidden um, value that he tries to unlock. There's all the political uh, Machiavellian activity in his company as, as each you know, of, the, uh, of the characters tries to carve their own niche. We've got um, some very real characters like Christopher, the ruthless boss, who always feathers his own nest, or Margaret, the femme fatale, who will use all her feminine, feminine guiles to get what she wants. Um, so the idea was very much to demystify the world through story. Um, and um, judging by the feedback, you know, people who aren't in the industry say, you know, this is amazing. The, the pages keep turning through story, but I'm learning about a whole world which I hitherto, you know, would gloss over. Mm -hmm. And it brings us to South Africa as well. So it obviously relates to people living in South Africa. It talks about, you know, get understanding emerging markets, understanding the complexities, understanding the uncertainties regarding the political landscape and, I suppose, economic hardship that a country like South Africa has gone through. And I, and I think that's what makes this book kind of pertinent to a South African to, to, to read this because it gives you kind of a, a first-class look at South Africa and understanding the investment landscape in South Africa and understanding some of the kind of political and social issues and how those kind of interwe interweave, so to speak, with, with markets. I mean, Sunil, uh, we've known each other, you know, for quite a while, of uh, quite, a, quite a period of time. I know you from Coronation, obviously, where you were a star fund manager and you managed mid and small cap money and obviously you got the opportunity to see a ton of companies and obviously look at their financials and be able to, you know, to, to, to make decisions for funds. But to kind of take that skill and to write a book such as this has taken you on a journey. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? How does a fund manager end up being an, an author? And a critique of the industry. It, it definitely is a critique of the industry and you know there, there, are, there are numerous rising loud, you know, more loud voices um, criticizing the industry. But how did I end up doing this? I mean I, I think that world is really interesting um, and, and it's, it's an ideal um, backdrop for, for a novel. We, you know, the joys and blunders of characters, their fear, their greed. Um, however, it's incredibly difficult to port portray tension and conflict in what is, you know, most of the time a meeting room with two people looking at a, uh, a, a share price on a computer screen. So I started this book about six years ago and was amazed at how difficult it was to write. I joined the uh, creative writing course at the UCT and that was you know really good in in um, um, learning how to write um, it's very different from everything I've ever done I mean I, I'm a chartered accountant I, I'm, I've got a master's in economics you know in many of those fields you um, you have a set of rules and you apply them but the right the art of writing is you know very much an osmosis it's it's th there isn't a perfect answer and you play with the sentence mm -hmm. um, until it rings true um, 
and 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 this idea of portraying South Africa, I think, I think so, uh, it was a Cape Times review. They said that this book is as South African as Pup and Vos. Um, it does. It gives you a very good expose into the world of money, into the you know the, the characters. For example, there's there's uh, Temba Kumalo, who's a very well connected politician who loves this country, but is about to sell out and 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 you know be corrupt. There's his son, who's a, an Oxford graduate, um, Jacob, a jolly guy who would love to be in the industry, um, but he wants to run before he can walk, and he's constantly frustrated by his, his um, you know, lack of ability in, in the world of numbers. Um, there's, there's e every story is a derivative, or every scene is a deriv derivative of real events. Um, so having had the kind of, whatever, 10 years in South Africa, learning about companies and learning about some of the 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 pros and cons in buying a share. My my hope was always very much to inform as well as entertain, and and the local publisher did want it, um, but they asked me to cut a lot of the financial stuff, and I, I I refused because I wanted I wanted the the book to retain, you know, some kind of intel academic uh, rigor in in exposing the world in understanding how share prices are valued, you know, what the current account deficit means. And, yep. and I'm very glad that you know, some of the, the feedback I've had has, has said that that's been achieved. So Neil, um, you obviously raise important issues about the investment industry. Maybe we can delve a bit into those. Now, not just the investment industry, but many other industries have this kind of conflict between the client's best interests and their own best interests in servicing those clients. And I think that to some extent is, is, is one of the, the themes uh, in, 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 the, in the book. Um, but why did you choose to write it in terms of a fictional kind of story? Um, somebody similar to, uh, to, to your kind of thinking is Nicholas Taleb, who fiercely criticizes the, in the investment industry. And uh, he doesn't write fiction. He actually tries to use a much more sort of scientific and, and uh, logical kind of approach to explaining why these problems are there and why they won't go away. Why, why did you choose to write a fictional story and not just tackle the bull by the horns? Because I wanted it to sell. I mean, I, I, you know, even as a um, um, person very interested in finance, the, the number of books that try and go into the nitty gritty of of the, the, the real world, I, I think, are, are quite, quite a chore to read. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's no reason why you can't fictionalize this, wor this world and, and provide it uh, uh, you know, with, with, with a lot of realistic backup. And, and there's also the risk of you know, plagiarism or, uh, sorry, not plagiarism, defamation. Um, you know, most of the characters in my book are very real, and people have come to me and said, wow, that's exactly like my boss. Uh, but I didn't want to be, um, you know, charged with, with libel. Yeah. One of the interesting aspects of the book that was uh, brought up very quickly um, was the issue of what it is that asset managers actually do. Uh, and of course, it brought up the intangible nature to a degree of, of the world of fund management. Because uh, whilst you're analyzing a real life company with real life assets, you're very far from it. You're dealing with uh, shares, you're dealing with share price movements. And when a share price goes up or when a share price goes down, it's not necessarily refre reflective of wealth creation or wealth destruction. Um, you know, I thought that an interesting aspect to bring up and something I think that perhaps fund managers or people in the industry often battle with because they're not always close to the company even though they're looking at the company's balance sheets uh, you know day in day out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that kind of that, that Sunil tries and hones in, uh, you know, as, as far as the book is concerned, is that a company can be a bunch of digits on a screen where you're literally just watching a company value going up and down on a continuous basis. But there's actual people working in this business. There's actual people's livelihoods that are uh, that are kind of at play in, in a business such as this. And only once you go and visit a company such as this, do you actually start realizing some of the, you know, some of the dynamics that are at play, uh, you know, in some of these businesses, of which one, obviously, and that's very, very close to any South African's heart would be black economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think he quite crucially kind of goes through that, um, you know, in, in, in the guise of Pluto Asset Management, which is this business that Ravi actually works for. And some of the issues that kind of, you know, that, that curtail to that and what it actually means for, you know, for, uh, for, for, for people that are working on the shop floor versus people that are actually sitting and managing money. I mean, Sunil, maybe a question just from me. I mean, black economic empowerment, do you think it's something that has worked in South Africa? Um, that's a, you know, very big question. <laughs> I mean, I, I, Do I, we I, have I, a whole, you know, five minutes left? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it can be answered by a yes or no. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I definitely feel that 
uh, we should move away from the pure granting on the base of color to uh, to um, an appraisal on the on the basis of merit and, and output. Um, and although there you know there was a need to redress the playing field um, that was you know very unlevel perpetuated by apartheid, um, there is now very much a need to restore meritocracy in our country and um, you know that applies to all spheres of, of, of business including government um, and I, I would love to see a bit more meritocratic um, rigor being applied to to the country as a whole. Sunil, also, you know, one of the issues that is being brought up is how um, how fund managers, how analysts deal with companies and company CEOs, um, and the relationship between uh, the fund management world, asset managers, and uh, and company management. I mean, what type of point were you hoping to make by that? Because you refer to these CEOs who, uh, you know, confuse aspirations with reality, the the eternal optimists, and how you kind of move through all of that noise and actually come to uh, a real conclusion there. Yeah, I mean, it. Was would be very difficult to you know summarize the entire field uh, with in, in one little book but uh, you know th through time we've th th well uh, since the tulip mania I guess we, you know we've constantly had uh, entrepreneurs and their visions and and the, the, the mismatching of their vision and, and reality we've constantly had people defrauding investors um, I've just picked up on a few of those specific situations I mean one that I pick on is, you know, in terms of the immorality within the industry is, is front running, you know, where mm -hmm. uh, the fund managers in Pluto Asset Management are about to buy this pretty large illiquid company, uh, sorry, small illiquid company, um, and they front run the share before um, the, the, the Pluto Asset Management actually takes its stake. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to deal with a few of the issues, but there's definitely scope for, for more. Um, you know, sequels, you, you can see the whole range, pink man's numbers, blue man's numbers. Um, there's, there's, there's certainly a, a whole host of problems, you know, that, 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 that could be addressed. I've yeah. just picked on a few in the first book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think the other thing that was quite interesting for me is, I mean, I went in and I bought this book and I had to ask the person servicing me on the other side of the, of the table, they kind of said to me, you know, it's interesting that you're asking me for, for this book. What, are there different numbers for white people and black people and people of color? <laughs> and I said to him, well, look, this is the title that, that was kind of chosen for the book. But uh, it's worthwhile actually picking up this book because uh, it'll, it'll, it'll tell you why this is called White Man's Numbers and how the book is actually plays out in the fund, in the, in the fund management space. And certainly, um, you know, another aspect that was brought up and of course uh, will always be a contentious issue is uh, the, the earnings of people in, in asset management and finance right now certainly has been under a lot of scrutiny and you're seeing bonuses being cut, you're seeing different ways of rewarding people. I mean, your views are on things that are taking place in the industry right now when it comes to re remuneration specifically, Sunil? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a need to, you know, re-examine the, the the school sheets. I mean, if you if you think about the subprime banking crisis as as a case in point, and the massive bonuses that were um, issued in the five years prior to two thousand and nine, um, the 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 bonuses on which those profits were based turned out to be illusory, um, and and massive losses were then taken by most of the uh, you know European and American banking system. Uh, whereas the bonuses that were, 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 were issued, you know, stood, stood firm. Um, things like that have received such a public outcry that I, I you know, I really hope there, there will be a, a further alignment of actual real profits, maybe matching, matching uh, bonuses on a five-year timescale as these profits enroll on the PNL and are, are not fictitious um, to, to people's salaries. This, this whole other idea of you know uh, being paid because the market goes up, um, you know, it's. I I I think the role of a fund manager is very important. The idea of allocating capital to its most productive use, mm -hmm. and share prices being a very important information signal in that regard. Um, so the role of fund management is a very useful one in the economy. But one should not be rewarded fortuitously. If if the market goes up thirty percent, you know, and you go up twenty percent, um, you should not be rewarded for that because you know you've just been riding on the 
on, on the coattails of a rising stock market and, I, and you've actually underperformed. So that I hope there'll be a lot more um, yeah, uh, reflection on, on the way fund managers are actually um, rewarded and yeah. what good they actually do. So Neil, one uh, quick question from me. In, in one word, um, how would you, or where would you say the, 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 the most emphasis has to be placed in, in making a significant change to improve the industry? Is it sort of honesty? Is it um, respect for clients? Um, is there sort of one thing that just stands out for you? I think shifting the, the time horizon would probably you know, be the most appropriate thing to say. Um, um, to a longer term horizon. We've seen remuneration structures within companies worldwide you know, trying to reflect the, the 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 profile of the company as w you know as opposed to the year that the bonus was was um, made I, I think I, I, I think that uh, uh, the underlying principles of matching reward with profit uh, sorry matching bonus with profit are, are there but the the time horizon has to change to reflect a longer term thinking by asset managers and all involved